we've reached the beginning of the end for our little velveteen whitetail friend here. What I mean by that is he has been drying for nearly two weeks and uh, he is fully dried. I would imagine the reasons are because one, his hair is very, very thin, very short. Two, with the short hair and the thinly shaved skin, it allowed him to dry a little quicker than your average winter coat whitetail would. Uh, but what I'm going to do, we're going to, I'm going to epoxy his eyes. Uh, I'm going to blend the skin of the nostrils to the nostril uh, epoxy that's already in place. Of course, I'm going to texture the nose pad. I'm going to uh, completely detail out the eyelids. He's going to have a nicotinating membrane put in place. I'm going to color the ear skins using uh, pan pastels. And the velvet on the antlers is going to be repaired and enhanced using uh, electrostatic flocking. And I will demonstrate that whole process. So without any further uh, ado, let's get to it. Let me start off first by pointing out one of the things I ended up doing uh, before fully setting this little guy aside to dry. I added a couple of um, uh, 18 gauge uh, wire nails to the edge of the skin uh, just below the burr where they were skinned away from the antlers. Uh, the reason being, uh, when he was skinned away, things got a little sloppy, a couple of little extra cuts were made, and I just wanted to ensure that it would not pull away during the drying process. So these were put in place, held with the little the uh, uh, pliers here, and a hammer drove the nails through the cape into the bone. So it's just a simple matter of grabbing hold of the nail, giving a slight twist and extracting them from the bone. That uh, using the nails is not a reflection on the hide paste used on its holding power. The Pro One of premium hide paste did an excellent job of holding it in place. This was simply little areas that I was concerned with because of the little cuts that were made along the burrs of the antlers. And being it was in the velvet condition it was when I skinned it, I just wanted a little extra added assurance that the skin would hold. You will notice, however, that there were no pins, no pins at all, put into the front corner of the eyes of this little fellow or just ahead of the, uh, the lacrimal gland on the, the eye crease. No pins were used. Normally I would put insect pins in there to hold them, fill the holes later. There were no pins used in this little fella here. And the, the reason the skin did not pull was because of the fact that during the mounting process, if you recall, I got in there with a brush and I put hide paste directly on the clay and then a layer of hide paste directly on the inside of the eyelid skins all the way around pressed them into tight contact with the clay, cleaned off the glass, and in the subsequent days of bagging and unbagging the head, I noticed it was drying without any, without any uh, pulling away, without any difficulty. The only thing I did do on the second day after I unbagged it, I noticed that the fold of the lacrimal gland skin here had opened just slightly, maybe half a millimeter, but it was enough that I took my modeling tool, I got in here with the point end of my modeling tool, opened it up a little more, took the Tech Bond thick cyanoacrylate adhesive, laid a bead of it inside the lacrimal gland, cleaned, cleaned it off the hair on the outside, and then repressed it into position and pressed it down tight. Held it a few seconds, took my hand away, and then simply got in with a towel and cleaned up the hair by just wiping it away. Um, I may have used a little uh, isopropyl alcohol on the towel, but that's what kept that clean. And the lacrimal skin, um, the, the lacrimal gland folds on both sides of the, of the face 
have remained closed tight. Now, it's a very, very uh, um, movable muscle on a live deer. I have photos of, of live deer that show it open. Um, they open it when they rub their head on uh, branches, on twigs. The gland opens and closes, opens and closes. I don't know if it's a um, just an instinctive thing or if it's actually controlled by the deer or if it, if it just uh, happens during the act of spreading the, their, their facial scent. Um, but they do open and close. I prefer, when I see a mount, I prefer the, to see them closed tight. And as you can see by the shadows caused on the face here, the facial veins have become very prominent for a deer with this length hair. Um, again, no hide nails, no pins were used, just every day coming along and pressing the skin down in tight contact with the head form. This also includes the facial structure, the muscles, the masseter muscles in the face, um, a little bit of the vein, the facial vein showing here in front of the cheek, um, the bucinator muscle here, which has a lot to do with the opening and closing of the, of the mouth, and also the cud chewing ability, the ability to roll the jaw around as it chews. Uh, all of these details dried beautifully on this on this little this little deer. He really has a beautiful face, chock full of details, without any hide nails to hold the details in place. It's simply hand pressure applied every day after unwrapping him. Now as can be seen here, I did in fact install some insect pins just below the bare skin of the lower lip to ensure that would hold in place. Um, normally I would I would have used a bead of the uh, gel type uh, cyanoacrylate glue, the CA glue, to hold that lip skin in place. This time I went with, remember I installed clay along the uh, the lip slot at the front there and I had paste just inside that the skin was able to be tucked in and held in place with paste. Now, these were applied after the second day unwrapping just to make sure I'm still old school enough to use pins where I think pins may be necessary. But these are double lot insect pins, very thin. Uh, the holes that they leave behind are very, very small and will be easily filled in with some uh, white epoxy. I simply take my needle nose pliers, give a little twist and pulling action, remove the pins. They're very, 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 very thin. and the pins are removed. At this point, I will take a wire brush, give a little brushing to the hair. Sometimes this is enough to close off some of the holes. If not, a little bit of white epoxy sculpt will be used to fill them in and allow them to dry. Also, one of the things I do during the drying process, I back brush the hair at the front of the muzzle just to give it a little, little bit of a rise as it's drying. Back brush it, then gently and carefully brush back with the direction of the hair. One of the first things to do, well, when finishing a deer, I like to take a nylon brush. This is part of a three set of brushes uh, that come. Uh, in, a, in a pack. I don't remember exactly where I got these from, but uh, many suppliers sell them. Uh, Matuska Taxidermy Supply I know sells them. Uh, I believe Research Mannequin sells them. Many, many suppliers sell them. They come in a pack with a, a nylon bristle brush, a steel bristle brush, 
and a brass bristle brush. Each one has its purpose in mounting any kind of specimen. But what I do first, I come along and I back brush, gently back brush the deer, brush them with the coat of the hair first, then back brush and brush it down again. You want to be careful not to break any of the hairs. That's the main thing. We brush back, then back brush, which is brush against the hair. Now that's done more at the front of the muzzle, the top and sides of the muzzle, and the lower jaw. Then again, that's all gently brush back down. Sometimes I'll just use my hand. Sometimes I'll use a smaller brush, like a toothbrush. Uh, a toothbrush is good for getting into tight details as well uh, to get the, the hair brushed down. And I'm going to go over the entire deer um, with this nylon brush, mostly because his hair is so doggone short, I don't want to break it. Um, I don't back brush the entire deer. I only, I only back brush on the face and most of that is concentrated from the muzzle, from about midway of the muzzle and the lower jaw down to the front. And then again, like I said, the hand goes over and lays the hair back down nice and gently. As stated, I like to use either a toothbrush or this brush I purchased from Matuska. Again, it's the Kemper's tool, the Kemper's Kemper tools brush. Um, this end with the um, cone shaped brush is great for getting in between tight areas like so. Also, a toothbrush. This is actually a, 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 a denture brush and pick. Okay. This can get in. This is good, stiff, but soft nylon bristles and this will allow you to get in tight this little one up here can get into tight places as well I also like to kind of scrub along the eyes using the toothbrush and you see how nicely the feeler has the vibrace of the top of the eyes has stayed uh, in an upright position that was done during the setting. Uh, the eyelashes have stayed in, in a really lovely position. Everything on this little fella just came right together better than I could have, better than anyone could have hoped. I mean, he just, everything with him just fell into place. That's what you want with every deer head. But with some, especially those that have got short hair like this, you really want it to work well. And for this little guy, it did. Before any further brushing can be done, I need to remove the staples from the back of the deer. And for that, I'm going to use one of my modeling tools. In this case, I'm going to use my Jonas modeling tool and my Leatherman pliers. I will be removing the staples with these two gizmos right here. I start by getting the tip of the modeling tool under the staples and lifting them up. They're in there good and tight. And I use that arrow air stapler. It's just, it's a lot easier than using the arrow manual stapler, staple gun. It's just, it's a lot easier. To have the power of the air, you know, 80 psi behind pushing the staples in. Hello. And these aren't even uh, these are not even uh, the angle tip staples. These staples are straight edged. So the fact that they're pushed in through the cardboard, through the hide, into the plywood backboard is pretty impressive. You can also 
use the tip of the pliers, but I find a modeling tool, a stainless steel modeling tool, is even easier to initially get under the staples. Some of them are in there real tight. And having the tool to loosen them is really a big help. Then you can pull them with the pliers. You can use needle nose pliers. You can use just the regular pliers. Oh, that, that, okay, that staple broke. Sometimes the staples will break. Getting close, twist and pull. First piece of cardboard's down. And you can see what a neat backing this, the way I, 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 I trimmed it and shaved it off, what a neat backing this gives to the deer. I see the best thing about it is it's going to get felt glued onto the back. And this little bit of hair will overlap the felt. The hanger will be placed in the middle about three quarters of the way up and it'll be a beautiful backing for your client's deer mount. Now I could use my nylon brush that I used on the face like so but I'm going to go with the brass brush. The reason is I want to be able to brush all of the dust out of the out of the hair and be able to brush over the back. This will help the brass brush will help do that more than a nylon brush could. You also want to brush the loose hairs that are still on the back side of the deer. Pardonnez-moi. Yeah, 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 Frenchie's back. See, that's why the only way you can brush the mount properly is after the cardboard is removed. Next I'll be flipping him upside down to brush out his underside. Okay, so I have a nice assortment of brushes here. We've got the denture brush, which can get into uh, brisket areas that are tighter than what's shown here. We've got a narrow brass brush, another nylon brush, and of course the wide brass brush that I use on the back. To start, I'm going to use the wide brass brush, and I want to go against the grain down here. In other words, brushing this hair that I groomed forward like so, I'm just going to brush it back. I'm going to brush any dried material out such as clay that might have been on my hands or what have you. Well, even though the cape was washed, there might be some residual salt dust. You want to get that out. And you can see just a little bit of dust flying off them. Now, I'll get in here with this nylon brush where it's a little close and do some nice grooming. going with the pattern of the hair. Okay, there we go. Now I want to come down the chest, or rather the front of the neck to the chest, and finish off along the sides. And again, I'm going to brush the back of the deer mount. <sighs> Blow off any and all excess dust and little, little snaggly hairs that brush off of it. Ready for the next step. To give the hide a nice cleaning, I like to zap it. Well, actually, I zap, I zap a towel, a white towel with lemon pledge. This removes a lot of the dust that might be on the hide. I zap a little bit onto the towel, pat it, and run it down over the hide in the direction or with the direction of the hair. This just gets off any, any surface dust 
real well. Imparts a nice, smooth feel to the hair, as well as a little sheen. And put them back in the upright position. I continue brushing in these tight areas, right around the base of the antlers, up behind the ears, and go against the grain, and then brush the hair back down. I'm using the denture brush for that. I want nylon bristles, but softer than what I've got on my regular brushes. Again, lemon pledge, very pretty. A little padding, and then over the entire thing. And this removes the dust. I used some of the Pro One hide paste thinned with water to create a hair setting gel. And that's what I used down the back on the seam. The shorter hairs on this buck hung up just a little bit using the upholsterer stitch than they would normally do on a long head, longer head white tail. Uh, I could have cut a channel down the back of the form where the incision was, filled it with clay, and after it was sewn, I could have pressed that into, into the clay and uh, tacked a few uh, uh, T-pins or hide nails in there just to make it tight against the, uh, the form. I did use some hide nails down the back of the seam. And this is, this is what you get. You get a little bit of, you get a little discoloration on the towel. That's what comes off the hair. Onward and upward. Here are the ingredients and the tools <laughs> for the first part of the finishing process. We have the epoxy sculpt, pink and brown. We have white and black. Now the black I use for building the nictitating membrane for this particular deer. This is the hardener, okay? Part A, part A, part A, part A of the color is the resin and this kind of gray green looking stuff right here is the hardener. You mix equal parts of A and B. I put warm, almost hot water in this flex bowl. The epoxy tends to mix better using warm water. I then use just isopropyl alcohol put into a little plastic cup and that's for dipping the brushes and the modeling tool into. You can see that there. Okay. That's just the alcohol to dip the tool in. The reason I dip tool, my modeling tools in alcohol and the brushes in alcohol over water is that the alcohol will evaporate faster than water and has less chance of soaking or re-soaking the epoxy. You don't want it to be too wet, okay? You don't want it to turn to mud and that will help it uh, cure uh, in a, not a faster time, but a I'm going to dig in time. with a modeling tool and pull out just enough of the pink epoxy this is going to be used for joining the skin of the nostril to the epoxy work that was done in the nostril during the form prep. Now this piece is a little too big for what I want. I'm going to just cut this in half, plop that back in there, throw the cover on. And I'm going to take an equal amount of the hardener. Now. If either one of these two ingredients gets hard, there are two ways to get them soft. One is you can put a piece of paper towel uh, that's been dampened with ordinary water. You can put it in here, you can cover it and let it sit and it'll regenerate. Or you can put this in a microwave just for a few seconds maybe 
five to ten seconds on medium high to high and it will soften the hardener right up. You usually don't have that trouble with the resin. The resin stays pretty soft, but usually it's always the hardeners that give you a hard time. Now, I'm going to just dip this in the warm water. The other reason I like using warm water is here in my, my basement shop. It's about, oh, the temperature varies between 62 degrees and 65. So using warm water instead of cold is nicer on the fingers. I'm going to continue to mix this, and when I come back, we'll be applying it to the deer's nostrils. The epoxy, or I should say the epoxy sculpt, sculpting epoxy, is needed until the two colors merge and become one. And one is the loneliest number. But one is the color you're looking for when you're mixing epoxy. The last bit of prep before applying the epoxy into the nostrils. You get in there with a nylon brush. I don't want to use a wire bristle brush. I don't want to tear the hair off of here. We'll get in and just clean out those nostrils a bit. Now, I'm going to take, I'm going to get some light in here. And I can see where the skin is laying on the epoxy in the nostrils. Yeah, I don't know how well this is showing up on camera or not, but I got to join that skin that's inside the nostril to the epoxy, uh, the epoxy work that's that was laid into the nostril during the form, during the form prep. Okay, chop a little bit off of the main body of the mixed epoxy. Go ahead and lay this in. Right now the modeling tool is dry. And now I dipped it in the alcohol and I'm going to press this down and join the skin to the existing epoxy on the nostril interior. I get in there with a light and get a good look at that. I don't want it to be too bright. There we are, that's a little better. Oh yeah, that's nice. Now I can really see it. I don't know if the camera can, but this is the way it's done. All right. It does not take a lot to join this up. Take a little more, another little piece of epoxy, and put it upward into the nostril. I'm going up and toward the front of the nostril. Again, I dip the curved end in, get in here, and model that in place. This is basically Taxonomy 101, aka finishing. I'm going to go ahead, and I'll see if I can't get a good view in there with the camera when I'm done. Did I forget to mention that you can tip the head oh, in one direction or the other when it's on the mounting stand? Oh, if I forgot, forgive me! Okay, I'm going to put this in up at the back of the nostril wing on the inside, on the interior, <coughs> the internal nostril flange and joint epoxy there. And I'm going to get the entire interior the entire interior, the complete interior, coated with the epoxy. It's coming along nicely. And finally, I can get in there with a little crummy old cheapo artist brush to get at Harbor Freight. 
or dollar store, wherever I got this from. This is most likely a couple of packs I picked up at Harbor Freight. You get in there with the brush and you can spread and texture the epoxy with the artist brush. And that gives it a good was it some sometimes especially with this little deer, getting in there with the curved end of the modeling tool is a little difficult getting all the way in to do this detail work, this closer work. You can use a um, a Q-tip cotton swab to get in there. Uh, I have been using brushes long enough that I'm comfortable getting in there with an old, old ragged, rugged, ragged artist brush. And one of the last places I'll add some epoxy will be where the upper and lower nostril skin meets at the back of the nostril. Now there's not too worried about um, you know the right color going in that'll be uh, handled during the repainting phase but I do want to get in there and straighten that out and make that look nice and neat. Now that that's smooth I'm going to give a little texture with the point of this previously used um, makeup applicator. I'm going to dip it a little bit in alcohol and I'm just going to go in here and poke around with the tip. Just poke into the epoxy. I want to get the smooth glassy look away from it. Give it a little bit of texture, a little bit of life. And as it dries, it will dry flatter with a flatter finish. And I'm going to use the paddle end, the paddle end here, and get in there. The flat should get in there a little better. I just want to texture this just a bit. There. This nostril is done. When everything is dry, I'll get in with a brush and brush the hair clean. You don't want to do it while it's wet. You don't want to disturb the epoxy sculpt that's been put in place. This is all that's left of the pink epoxy sculpt. Onto the eyes. Now, because there is so little drawing away from the glass with the eyelids, the smallest amount of epoxy needs to be used. I made up just this much. This is both A and B already mixed. Ready to start laying the epoxy against the eyelids. Okay, I've rolled out a little brown worm of epoxy. And I've got some alcohol on the tip of this modeling tool. I'm going to start laying this against, sure I am, I'm going to start laying this against the lower eyelid first. I work, I work on the lower eyelids first, then I flip the deer over and work on the upper lid. There is little to no pulling away of the eyelid skin from the glass eyes. That's because of the way they were set. Just to recap, again, I know I've already done it, but just to recap, what was done was <coughs> the Pro One Hide Paste, Pro One Premium Hide Paste, was inserted into the eye work on a flat artist brush, and the hide paste was brushed against the clay and then again brushed against the inside skin of the eyelid. And that combination of hide paste on the clay and hide paste on the eyelid 
is responsible for them, the eyelids, not shifting. Well, that and the fact that they were shaved real, real thin, which is, that's good practice anyway, whether you're using the tuck method or just the, the old type eye setting method, which is what I've, I have reverted to. There's not much epoxy really on here. But you want to be careful that you don't scrape it all away. You do want some. You want just a little bit. You want it riding along the top edge of the lower lid as well as the underside of the upper lid. Just because. And that's the only reason I'm going to give. Just because. And what I do is I tap it. Rather than swipe my tool across it, I like to tap it down. And as you tap it, you can see it folding away here. Then we'll come in with the tool and bring it away. Get it the heck out of there. Does not need to be there. I want the front corner deep. So I'll use the spear tip of this modeling tool. Get in there. Make sure it's modeled deep. Create the little V, and with the spear edge, I'll go along and smooth the epoxy. Okay. Like so. Try my best not to remove any as I do this. There. Wunderbar. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to further smooth it using a brush dipped into the alcohol. Just rubbing alcohol, not denatured alcohol, just plain rubbing alcohol. I need to replace the batteries in my headlamp. It's not as efficient as it should be. And the white that's showing at the front corner of the eye, this will be taken away when the nictitating membrane is installed. Now I'm going to clean the glass with some Windex. I'm going to go on the other eye, do the lower lid on the, on the opposite eye, then he's going to be turned upside down and you'll see the upper lid epoxied in. And here we are with the head upside down and showing the little tiny space where the upper lid is at, is at the glass. What you really want to be careful here is to keep the epoxy out of the eyelashes. So I'm going to try to lay this little brown snake a little brown snake goes out of the hole, goes back in at a hole, runs back out of the hole again. Quint from Jaws. But this little brown snake needs to stay in place. There we go. Okay, that's a good start. That's a good start right there. And now I bring this down the front. And just like I did on the bottom, I want to tap it in place, into place. I'm going to move the lashes down out of the way and set the epoxy. Clean off my tool just a little bit. I'm going to get in here with a good amount of alcohol. I want to kind of bash this down without catching the eyelashes, which is being, it's a little difficult, but you just have to work at it a little bit. You can keep the eyelashes out of the epoxy and vice versa.
There we go. All right, now, now we're getting someplace. Now we're moving. Now we're moving. Okay. If you do catch them, if you do catch the eyelashes in the epoxy, just work the epoxy outward and you'll take the eyelashes out with it. Like so. Whoops, okay. Well, they don't need that little piece that just fell. There we are. Okay. I gotta get this epoxy at the back edge of the eyelid. I need to hold the lashes down out of my way. There we go. Okay. That epoxy ball out of the lashes. Get away, get away, go away. All right. I'm going to take the spear tipped end of the modeling tool and come in and model. Get this off the lashes. Remove the epoxy from the lashes. But you don't want it to cure on the eyelashes. You'll have a nasty hard spot and when you try to pull it out after it's dried, more than likely you'll end up plucking one or more eyelashes, and you don't want to do that. There we go. Hi, hi, hi. There we are. There we go. Okay, now, get the brush, the shortened flat bristle artist brush that I clip bristles from. Get in there, smooth this around, and remove what epoxy you can, if need be. Put it at the back of the eye. Now push the epoxy into the rear edge of the eye. So much easier to put the thing upside down, to put the head upside down to do this. So much easier. <laughs> when I was younger, I used to, used to twist myself like a pretzel to get up underneath and work the darn thing when it was in the upright position. But now that I'm older, wiser, and more sore, I get sore more easily. I try not to extend myself like that. And these mounting stands are made, they're constructed to make things a little easier on us. So, why not utilize that feature? There we go. Now I'll get the other eye, and then we'll turn them right side up. And there we I'll have it. The, the epoxy work is complete on the eyes, but for the nictitating membrane, which will be handled a little later on after the brown epoxy sets up. Uh, you don't really want to blend the black into the brown, so I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait until the brown epoxy sets a bit. I really want it to firm up a lot. There's not a lot of it there, so it's going to take a little longer than usual for it to set up. Other than that, I like I like what's what's going on here with this little fella. I think he looks. Just dandy. Mm, mm, mm.